Good morning and welcome to the Local Connections from US Arab Radio. We thank you for being with us and wish you a wonderful day. The war between Israel and Hamas continues and abated. Efforts to secure the ceasefire have failed and the situation is dire. With us this morning is Alma Dufour, deputy of the French National Assembly who has visited Gaza. And uh, good morning and thank you for being with us, Ms. Dufour. Good morning. Thank you very much. Sorry so for my French accent. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. When did you visit Gaza? Uh, about one month ago. I, I I did not have the right to enter Gaza. Actually, I was blocked uh, at the at the border at Rafa on the Egyptian okay. side uh, okay. because uh, the Israeli government doesn't let any uh, uh, parliamentary representative that stand for the ceasefire enter in their. Territory, which is not really their territory, but in the the, the Gaza the Gaza Strip. So we were um, blocked at uh, Rafah's gate uh, in the Sahel Desert uh, from the Egyptian side, where we mm -hmm. met a lot of humanitarians that could go and cross the borders. They have the right to. So they tell, told us about the really really dire situation, as you said, uh, in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. Did you try to ask the Israelis if you can go in? Yeah, and uh, I then didn't uh, get the, the authorization. Actually, we, we have also a problem. We have a lot of, a lot. We have some French uh, citizens that are still uh, inside the Gaza Strip and they want to go out and uh, Israel doesn't, do not even give the authorization to go out. So we have the, the, the other way around problem is that we are French citizens that are just stuck by Israel uh, decision and that are dying slowly of uh, illness and 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 uh, injuries and uh, and the government of french of french government doesn't say so doesn't say much yeah and that's what i was going to ask you has the french government asked israel to allow uh its citizens to to cross because it would have to be arranged between the french the egyptians and the israelis otherwise they cannot cross yeah no actually they they suppose they, they told the French government is telling us they are doing so. They are asking the French citizens to 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 go to get out of Rafa, but they are not. Um, I don't know how do we say they they do not. They're not arranging any... for them. Yeah, they're not arranging. Yeah, they they're not very on. They're, it's not on the top of their priority list. It seems. Excuse me for the expression, but uh, we ask, we we ask, we ask again, and they say, oh, we'll see, or oh, maybe we still don't have an answer, and. And during this time, we have, for example, a, a French teacher in the uh, university of near my my territory, my circumscription uh, of election uh, that he, that died from diabetes uh, because he couldn't go out of uh, Gaza, and there is no more hospital working enough to treat someone with diabetes in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. So, so situations like that, we have a, a young child that that's named Omar. He's three years old. Uh, Omar Znaidi, and he, he has suffered from bombing. He, he's severely injured, and he could die from the repercussion of the bombing if he's not taken care of in the proper hospital that works with all the equipment and medicament and and, and, and care that uh, that we have in in our country. And and he's going to die, and he's three years old. And the government doesn't French doesn't look very concerned about his fate. Let's say this. That how way. do you, how do you feel that your government is not listening to you and is not allowing is not arranging for its citizens to be evacuated out of Gaza? It's very very painful. It seems like um, when it concerns uh, the Israeli government action, there is a lot of uh, how would you say two sides, two measurements. You know, like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are the very 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 strong and it's normal reaction for the French hostages. Uh, for, of Hamas, and they are still uh, regularly asking for their liberation, which, which we totally uh, agree with and, and stand for. But from the other way around, and the, just the French citizens, uh, uh, teachers, medics, or 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 even uh, ONGs, uh, NGOs, sorry, uh, personnel um, that are blocked that are blocked in Gaza, they do not speak about. And for example, we have this very strong example. There was a, a national uh, homage, homage. I don't know how you say, yeah. Yeah, homage uh, like a ceremony, a ceremony for the 
for mm-hmm. the French Israeli that died on the 7th of October. And it was a yeah. huge, huge, huge national ceremony. And mm-hmm. they did a very, very little private, non-public ceremony for the French Palestinian that died uh, from the Israeli attacks. Why do you so think you... that is? Mm. Why because, do you think that... because they are very, because French are, are, since Emmanuel Macron is elected like six years ago, there are be a, an alignment more and more with the Netanyahu's government and more and more, uh, how do you say, um, uh, sorry, right wing, the, right wing. Yeah. Um, I, Okay, sorry, I I have to start again because my my, my English is not that good. Um, for that's okay. Like for 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 the the people who who hear us, we have to set in the to have to take back in time, uh, go back in time. Like for a long long period, French was really supporting the Palestinian cause and the creation of a two state solution. It was also the the view of General de Gaulle, which was a, a right wing a president, but was which was really really. Uh, supporting uh, the Palestinian people rights to have uh, to their own existence, their own determination, and and the state. So that was uh, the historic French position. But after nine um, eleven, actually, and after uh, the election of uh, of your president Bush, and then our our president Nicolas Sarkozy uh, in France, that was right wing too. The, the the position start, started to 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 switch. And 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 the Palestinian cause uh, ceased to be progressively supported by the subsequent French president, and we end up with Macron, that is a more pro-Israeli president we have never had. He has he has invited Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, five times already in France um, before the seventh October, um, and he is not uh, he was not speaking anymore about the Palestinian right to have a state, and it was like a forgotten cause, you know. So uh, there is like more support uh, from the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. It is, is really clear. And now Macron is starting to say this, this cannot continue. He's appealing for a ceasefire. That is good. That is the first step. But the French government did not take any measure, uh, economic, ec- economical sanction or uh, uh, arms boycott to, to Israel that prove that they are really in putting all their efforts to stop this bloody massacre. Yeah. How, how do the French, the, the average person in France, you know, uh, uh, feel about the whole situation in Gaza? Well, I, I'm not sure if there is an average person on this subject. There are a lot of youngsters and a lot of persons that are really, 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 really shocked. Uh, really, really concerned. Um, it has, it has, uh, how do you say? It has, uh, make reborn the trauma of colonization also in sure, French. Sure. And you know, French is a country that colonized yeah. a lot of countries. And we have a lot of, uh, citizens that come from those colonized countries. And so, of, of course, for them, it's a, a, a huge suffering and they feel very, very concerned. There is a part of the population that is in the middle. Side, you know, and there, there is such a huge media um, propaganda uh, for Israel in France, in the all big, big mainstream media, you know, TV media. Sure. Um, there are really Zionist positioning. Uh, so a lot of people just don't know what to think anymore because there have been, uh, there have been brainwashed by propaganda for like four and a half months now. Mm-hmm. And so they 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 get they grasp that something bad is happening in Gaza, but they 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 still don't find the strength to to condemn really Israel because I, I think because the the ambience the media uh, uh, narrative around what happened and what is happening is so distorted, you know. Sure. And and also I know a lot and I will not speak their names because uh, it would be it would be unfair. But I know artists, for example, singers or actors that French actors that don't want to to to, to take position not because they they are ignorant of what is happening because they fear for their career. And we at this stage uh, now in France and they have told me so. They have said I I I would like to support your protest uh, on uh, tomorrow. We have a big big protest uh, in Paris. We hope it would be big. And we ask uh, actors mm-hmm. and singers to support us, and they were afraid for their career. 
Yeah. Now, when you went to to Rafa, what did you? How long did you stay there? Five days. Five days. Five. Yeah. Five, yeah. five uh, very uh, busy, busy days. We we met with a lot of people, and as you may know, to cross the Sinai Desert, you have to have the 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 validation from the Egyptian side, like the Egyptian army is a military zone. So. So we were uh, highly, uh, highly taken care of <laughs> so we, by the French embassy and the, and the Egyptian government. So, so yes, we, we stayed five days. Yeah. And what did you see? What did you witness? I witnessed uh, several things. Uh, we, we spoke with the humanitarians um, and most notably with medics, also French medics. That, that was a rare French that have the right to cross the, 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 the border mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. Israeli side. Mm -hmm. And they told us that they, they came back from Rafa, but on the Gaza side, on the Palestinian side. And, uh, and they were working in the last hospital, the last hospital working in Rafa, at the European hospital. And they told us about a situation that is so incredibly horrible to just imagine that uh, that i was like in a shock of state and they were in shock like the medics that came by were in shock even the um, the the head of the delegation that that speciality was war medicine you know so heavily injured people and he was like in shock in state of shock and saying i i, I couldn't bear it anymore like because the, the, the hospital has become a city in itself because there are 1.5 million people that are forced to be gathered in Rafa, that is a city that can only uh, allow 200,000 people. You know, you see the difference. It's huge. So people are sleeping yeah. in the hospital, yeah. sleeping in tents. They don't have, have food anymore, not water anymore. Uh, women from Gaza are, are shaving their heads because there is not enough uh, water to just wash their hair and they don't want to get disease and infection and and the, and the children are starving and, and the, the parents just uh, stop giving taking food to give their ration to their children. You know, that is how bad the situation is, how bad the situation is. They are, make, they are forced to, to, to take choices like, do we, go, do, we, do we give morphine to a child that, that got a bullet in his shoulder or to a child that got his leg stripped over by a bombing, you know? Sure, and, sure. And, and, the, and the adults do not get any morphine anymore, you know? And so, 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 we, so, so that's... What we learn, we learn also that the humanitarian are uh, voluntarily targeted by the, the Israeli army. They said that, that their uh, uh, warehouse from humanitarian aid on the other side, on Gaza side, were bombed several times. So mm -hmm. they are bombing the warehouses that is receiving the aid from the international countries to go to the Rafa population, they also, the Gaza population. They also told us that the Ed is so insufficient that it only covers 5% of the needs of the Gaza population. And in those 5%, uh, Israel is still uh, blocking some of the, 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 the ad that is trying to enter because uh, they pretend that it could be an help for Hamas and stuff like that. But I've seen the, what they rejected at the border. There was uh, oxygen bottles, uh, clean water kits, uh, Urgent medical aid kit uh, sent by France, actually, that were blocked uh, in the Egyptian side. And we saw line and line and line and line and line and line of trucks, of food trucks that are waiting to enter and they cannot enter. So it's it's really, really, really frustrating to see that. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the humanitarian that just giving their life to, to help uh, Gaza population because they know they could get killed in doing so. And, and I can just uh, finish with this example. We met with the Red Crescent, like the Red Cross, uh, the Red Crescent um, that told us that um, two, uh, how do you say, medic car ambulance uh, sure. were uh, l were lost because they were sh searching for a little girl that parents were murdered, and and the, and the little girl was the only surviving survivor of a car shot of of a car shooting, and it was in Rajab, and we didn't know at the time. And they said our, our colleagues are, have disappeared for four days searching for the little girl. And we don't know what happened to them. We fear that might be dead. And yeah. we got back in France and we heard that in the Rajab, the little girl and the colleagues and the, and the, and the Red Crescent colleagues were dead. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. 
Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Nachi Abood at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Nachi Abood now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design. New location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Najee Abood, 734-744-9796. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. Welcome back and thank you for being with us. Uh, we're talking with Alma Defour. She's deputy of the French National Assembly who has visited Gaza recently. You know, I mean, the French, the champions of freedom, human rights and all of that. And and then they turn their face the other way. And uh, it's just uh, mind boggling. I mean, it's just I mean, I know England does that, but England is the source of all problems in the world, you know, all the <laughs> and all of that. But, you know, I've had... Uh, I had more uh, faith in the French that they would, at least on the humanitarian aspect, that they would do more. And um, unfortunately, I don't see that. Uh, you know, what 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 is the France doing on the humanitarian aspect? Not much. And you're right there. They're sending a bit of head. Um, they have a... They, they, the Macron did a huge, President Macron did a huge uh, publicity on a medical boat that would uh, go to Gaza uh, in the in in the sea, but it was only four. Uh, it could take care of four really badly injured people, so it was nothing. And they and they said, "Oh, look at us! We 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 are humanitarian a government. We are helping people." And and this was the boat they sent for four. Uh, badly injured people, so it was nothing, and now they're starting to to send more uh, food and and uh, and uh, and pills and and other medical treatment stuff needed, but it's not it's really highly insufficient. They did not want to um, to raise the the money we give to UNRWA. We we ask uh, in uh, November because I'm a pre I'm part of the finance commission at the parliament, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so uh, on the budget. So we asked uh, La France Insoumise, my political uh, movement, ask for a raise in the money we give to UNRWA uh, that is taking care of the medical uh, and the humanitarian aid in Gaza, and they refused. Um, and there is this huge distortion. Uh, they, they really are increasing the aid we are giving to Ukraine. Uh, to 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 survive to the Russia invasion and to to fight back, but they they are not at all increasing the humanitarian aid for for Gaza. So you're right; they're doing not much. Yeah, unfortunately. And then, unfortunately, and we we are we are trying to understand why why is that. Uh, I mean, there is a there there is two problems, I guess. It, there is an in, internal problem. From my point of view, the internal problem is, as I said, um, there are a lot of uh, high power person in the media, notably that are very Zionist aligned. So if you want to be popular and not to be uh, charged with uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, accusations, it's mm -hmm. like that in France. I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I myself, I could have been uh, treated, uh, li labeled as an anti-Semitic person. And it's uh, like they do that with every person that is supporting Gaza. 
uh, right now in France. And I even tried to do it with Macron the first time he, he spoke about the ceasefire. And uh, it was really intense. So so there is an internal um, fight, uh, cultural and political fight in France. And if you want to, to not to be... Um, how do you say, uh, charged with labels and charge, you have to better to not uh, open your mouth or act too much for Gaza. So that's the first thing. And I think it, it counts a lot because Emmanuel Macron is a president that do a lot uh, for communication. You know, he's a, he's a very, sure. uh, he, sure. he governed and he got reelected by really heavy uh, support for this media, actually, uh, these big medias. So so that that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think is... Uh, I don't know what, um, because your country, United States, is still the, the, the one that is still really blockading uh, any shift of the situation at the international level by putting vetoes at, uh, mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. Security Council of uh, the NATO. Um, I don't know what are the, the discussion between Biden and Macron on this subject. And sure. I know, uh, and I don't know if the United States could put pressure on, on France and European countries to not act too much. And to mm -hmm. not uh, put economical uh, sanctions, for example, I I don't know because as a French parliamentarian, we no, we are not informed of uh, diplomatic uh, the details of the diplomatic action of our president. It is like something that is uh, of the president competency. You know, I, I'm not sure it's the same thing in the United States, but in well, French it, the parliament, yeah, it's, quite, it's a little uh, bit different uh, here. Yeah. And um, President Biden yesterday said he plans to construct. A temporary port in Gaza to bring in the uh, the aid into Gaza, and um, you know that's going to take a few weeks. But still, it's better than uh, not doing anything. And I hope that you know the French would uh, would uh, would join there and bring in this way. They have no excuse not to send in aid. Yeah, sure. No, no. I, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think they will join. But what is unfortunate is that so many people are. Will be already dead, you know, because uh, thirty hundred uh, dead, thirty hundred thousand dead uh, is a is a numbers given by the Hamas. But actually, uh, all the military experts said there is far more death actually from from hunger, from illness, from lack of water. And I I think I fear that the population in Rafa cannot wait for three weeks more to 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 get this aid. So. Maybe it's, it would be less. I, I don't know what uh, what a period of um, what delay uh, Biden has announced. But uh, yes, Fr France has to do more. But but also it's it's not even it's a, on the humanitarian aspect. But more we have to stop this politically because there is no more there is no there is not anything left in Gaza. Like they they bombed they destroyed about sure. half of the buildings of the Gaza Strip. There sure. is no more water infrastructure, um, core, um, electricity infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, like nobody can live in Gaza anymore. So we have to have a plan, an international plan, you see, uh, for the creation of a Palestinian state and a huge effort to reconstruct uh, the, 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 the Gaza Strip. And, and, and it was... Humanitarian aid will not suffice. The people will still die if we do not obtain this ceasefire permanently and reconstruction. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And we thank you for all you do on the humanitarian side to reach for the Gazans and trying to help them as much as possible. Thank you so much. Sorry for my bad English. <laughs> That's okay. You <laughs> did very well. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> thank you it. so much. Okay. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bottom serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CDC guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. 
Life for Relief and Development has now been rated as one of the best charities for humanitarian aid. Life's humanitarian projects span the globe, and Life is celebrating its 30th anniversary of providing essential life-saving aid to people and communities in 36 countries, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. Where there is life, there is hope. And when disaster occurs here or around the world, including being one of the first responders to the Turkey-Syria earthquake crisis, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. We are looking to help the earthquake victims, and we take 0% overhead on emergency donations. So please help improve these efforts. Learn more about our involvement to help the helpless and bring hope where it's needed most. And make your tax-deductible donation to Life for Relief and Development now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. That's 248-424-7493. Welcome back and thank you for being with us. This is Khalil Hashem, editor of Michigan.com with the US Arab Radio. The war in the Middle East has been escalating beyond the borders of Israel since October 7, with the fear that it would explode the entire Middle East. One of these areas is Lebanon, and in particular is southern Lebanon, where a mini war has been taking place. With, uh, with us this morning is Michel Helou. He's a secretary general of the Lebanese National Bloc. Good morning, uh, Michel. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Mr. Hashim, for having me on, uh, on, on air. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Could you tell us a little bit about you and then also what is the Lebanese National Bloc? Sure. So I uh, am currently the secretary general of this party. I got elected in 2022, uh, uh, but more than a year ago uh, to this position. Um, we are a national, uh, secular, democratic party in Lebanon. And this is something very, very rare. Um, now, to come back to where I come from and how I decided to join this very quickly, basically, I was um, born in Switzerland, in Geneva, Switzerland, um, uh, 1989. I grew up there like so many Lebanese who are actually uh, immigrants. You know, my parents left the country at the beginning of the Civil War. My dad went to the U.S., my mom went to France, and they grew up in Switzerland, uh, then moved to France, then moved to Dubai, like a lot of Lebanese. I decided to come back in uh, 2015 to run the oldest um, newspaper running in Lebanon, which is L'Orient Le Jour, French yep. and yep. English speaking yep. newspaper. So I was the publisher of L'Orient Le Jour for six years. And then after the port blast, after August 4, 2020, I decided that journalism was good, but it was not enough to change the country. Hence, I decided to quit my job and run for elections. This is when I, I set up a campaign uh, in Babda, which is my hometown, although mm -hmm. I, you know, I came to Babda when I was only 25, but still mm -hmm. it's a place where, that I'm very close to, um, and ran. And I ran through the national bloc. I joined at that moment this party that I had, that I was close to in the ideas, um, and which is actually a party, the national bloc, a party that is at the same time very old and very young. It's a party that was founded. Uh, at the time of Emil Idde, so still at the time of the French mandate in the 90s, 20s, sure, sure. and 30s, sure. um, but then kind of disappeared from the political scene during the civil war because it's the only party that decided not to take arms against its uh, fellow Lebanese. Um, it's the only party that did not turn into a militia. Demolition. We decided with, this, with a group of people to launch it, to relaunch it, reactivate it in 2018 with Carlos Idde, uh, among them, who was the, the nephew of Raymond Eddé, the historic leader, and, and, and a lot of other people, mostly young people, secular people, people that really believe in um, protecting the state and develop, building the state of Lebanon and uh, economic and political reform. So this was, this was really uh, our platform and secular people that believe that sure. we should be considered as citizens and not just as members of a specific community. Um, so and that was that has been our, our work. So during the, the campaign, the 2022 electoral campaign, which we built also on the wave of this um, revolution, the uprising mm -hmm. that had happened in 2019. Um, and, and so we were all in the streets for a month and we tried to push for change as much as possible. And we kept going during elections. We got 12,000 votes in total. Um, and which makes us one of the, you know, uh, 
biggest structures in the in the change movement. And I was I got close to six thousand votes in in Babda in my constituency. Um, and since then, I kept going. Uh, so I got elected as secretary general a year and a half ago, and now we're working, working day in, day in day out to uh, recruit young people, develop our platform, and be ready to reclaim our country. Even though we know it's going to take time, but we're extremely committed and persistent. Absolutely. Do you have any members in the parliament right now? So we don't have members in parliament. Uh, most of us were young candidates. Three of us. Uh, we were five candidates. Three of us were very close to winning. Uh, I actually beat two current members of parliament who won, although they had very low number of votes because that's because of how the law is made. That was designed yeah. to yeah. support bigger parties and not uh, uh, independent yeah. candidates like yeah. ours. So, yeah. Yeah. but still, we 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 know now how we we've got you know strong better experience that we're going to use it to win next time. And also, currently in parliament, there are twelve MPs which we call the change MPs that are very close to us, which we support. And then there's other MPs also with whom we work. So we cooperate a lot with current members of parliament. That's good. That's good. What, you know, before we talk about what's going on in the South, you know, there, there are two things that are very important. And, and you alluded to one of them, which is the electoral system in Lebanon. The election system is really terrible. And, you know, that does not afford people like you who want to make a change to really make uh, make it on the scene. What's going to take to change that? I think that the biggest problem actually is even it's even worse than that. It's the um, the fact that there's no certainty about our democracy. There's nothing fixed in the sense that when those parties, you know, this mafia that has been the mafia and militia that have been governing the, the country for the last 30 years, when those guys get to power, then they are allowed or they, they, they enable themselves to cancel elections or to postpone elections as much as they want. And this is the biggest threat on our electoral system. On top of that, and this is what, this is what has been going on for the, with the local municipal elections for the last three years. Uh, it's the third time now that they're, that they're currently you know, postponing municipal elections, although we, we really, really need them. Um, and 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 so we, we're going to need to fight a lot to make sure that the next elections will happen in 2026. So the first thing that we need to do to change that is to lobby massively uh, inside Lebanon and outside Lebanon to make sure that we will have uh, that we will have um, um, parliamentary elections in 2026. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of lobbying. There's a lot of pressuring. There's a lot of working with. Uh, <laughs> observers you know they send like the eu european union and, and other members of the international community they send uh people that come that observe elections that make sure that the elections are transparent etc we need massive pressure for that um, yeah. and you know because it's not just the fact that uh, uh, there's no proper democracy because because they can cancel elections also the fact that they buy votes massively that they distribute services all year round so you come here and you compete with people that have budgets that are 10 times or 100 times bigger than yours yeah. Um, they can you. They can. They have weapons like Hezbollah, etc. So, all of that obviously makes the system much, much more difficult. We need to fight, you know, battle after battle, step by step. First, make sure that elections happen. Then, pressure as much as possible so we get um, a good um, uh, governance of elections. For that, we need support from EU and international observers. What we also need for that is mega centers. So, mega center will be a huge battle. Mega centers actually means that instead of forcing everyone to go back to their hometown to vote, we allow them to vote where they live. And this where is they live, yeah, yeah, one difference. man, one vote, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. this is yeah. a battle that we're going to be fighting. Uh, also, because it prevents them from controlling voters. The thing is, when you have small, isolated uh, voting, uh, 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 you know, ballots or voting uh, offices then it allows the local parties to, they, they have their local mafia, et cetera, allows them to control how voters vote and to pressure them. Well, if you gather a bigger number of voters in a more anonymous way, then it prevents them to control uh, the votes and this will massively change the results. The third thing also critical is the diaspora votes. And here I'm, I know I'm talking to the people of Michigan and, and, and you know, the, all the Lebanese in the US, we will need a massive support from you guys um, that you pressure our embassies and consulates to make sure that you preserve your rights in terms of voting, because the biggest risk that we're going to be facing 
is that in the law that they passed in 2017, what they're doing is that they are carving out six seats that are only for the diaspora. But what that means is that the diaspora is only represented uh, by six seats out of 134, which is not much. Mm -hmm. Although in, in this law that they're trying to, impl to, to, to implement, although in the reality, uh, the way the diaspora voted last time was that they probably are worth 10 to 15 seats out of 128. And if there's more people who register, and I'm sure that we can get many more people to register, in that case, the, 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 the expats can you know, weigh or can influence at least 20 or 25 seats in parliament. So we need to fight massively altogether to make sure that why, why do we need preserved. why do we need to uh, i mean i live in in michigan i'm an american citizen i don't live in lebanon why do i need to get involved in what's going on in lebanon as far as representation i mean this is a representation for the lebanese in their government i'm only a visitor to lebanon um even though i was born in lebanon but uh, you know on the other hand is that uh, basically representation is for the people who are in in, in Lebanon. I mean, why do people outside Lebanon should have a say in what's going on in the country? Khalil, you and I have the opposite uh, trajectory. You were born in Lebanon and you left and you went to the US. I was born abroad because my parents had left 50 years ago and I decided to come back. Um, I believe that both of us are very attached to Lebanon, even though both of us have a diverse identity. Sure, sure, sure. sure, you know? sure. All of us have, have a variety of, of, of uh, maybe uh, citizenships and lived maybe several places across the world and we speak several languages, etc. But the reality is that I believe that Lebanon has a very important value. Lebanon has a, a moral, uh, uh, an ethnical, a cultural, a political uh, uh, philosophical value for the Lebanese in Lebanon, for the Lebanese abroad, and for all the people, because Lebanon um, means a lot, not just because I think that we, as people, we need as, 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 you know, as human beings, we need a place where we belong to. We need a place where, you know, that sure, feels sure, like home. Sure, sure. And, and, and also, I get that. I really get but that. Also, but, you but also because Lebanon is, also because Lebanon is, is, is you know, uh, has something very specific, this ability to, uh, the fact that on a, such a small piece of land, there is first that much diversity in term, from a geographic and natural perspective, which is, you know, makes it an incredible country, but also this diversity in terms of people and ethnicities and religions. And this is a laboratory of what could work and also what is currently failing in the world. So we have a role that is not just limited to Lebanon. We have a much larger role to show and to play. And there's been a lot of emigration in Lebanon for the last 200 years, um, uh, close to 200 years, 150 years. And uh, among them, people like Gibran Khali Gibran, who were in the United States and others. And Absolutely. a lot of people from, fought from abroad and they were able to reclaim their country from abroad. What I'm saying is that if we don't fight for our country, we might lose it completely. So and, and I, and, and I, appreciate, getting yeah. involved, and I really appreciate, I appreciate that. And I think, I think you represent the sentiment of a lot of Lebanese when you speak as an independent. At the same time, Absolutely. you know, uh, election is and, about and, representation. And, and, and just representation. One, more, one more word on this. When you vote in Lebanon, you don't vote just to, you know, uh, uh, to, to have a say in the small local matters such as water and electricity and stuff that are actually essential. But still, you vote to say, look, um, I'm part of this country and I don't want to lose this country. And even if I've been abroad for a while, I'm still very connected to this country. And maybe if I, maybe I'm not going to come back, maybe I'm going to come back one day to, the, to Lebanon and live there. But at least I want my kids to know that, that, you know, this is also their country and that they should be proud of their country and that they're allowed to come back and to know more about this culture. And I think that our generation has a massive responsibility to make sure that we don't lose what's left of our country because we might lose it completely and i can tell you something yeah, it will be sad it will be really we're sad. all gonna regret it no. we're all gonna regret it if yeah. we don't fight for our country properly yeah and there's no doubt lebanon is one of the most beautiful countries in the world you know, there's really no doubt about that and it's really sad to see the economic situation there what can be done i mean right lebanon used to have a very strong banking system and right Absolutely. now that's terrible what's going on there what what can be done 
there is a deep economic and financial reform that needs to be done. But to start with the most important, it's not so much uh, an economic and technical problem, but rather much more a political problem. What you need exactly. is political exactly. will, people that are ready to make tough decisions, to, to, <clears throat> you know, to take on uh, this, this, this sort of political financial mafia that has been running the banking system and funding the state and funding politicians and corruption for decades take on this, face it properly, and do full-fledged reform that are needed. Now, in terms of reform package, um, it's not, it's not uh, except, I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously full-fledged and deep, but it's something that we've seen in other countries, uh, but obviously with a bigger scale in Lebanon because the whole system collapsed. So there is, at the same time, there's a public debt crisis, there's a balance of payment crisis deficit, there is a currency crisis, and there is a banking sector crisis. All these four elements and sectors have collapsed, and we need to work on all these four. So both on the public sector, on the private sector, and the banking sector, currency-wise, and, and you know, so central bank-wise as well. Absolutely. All of these need to be reformed, and the only way they can be properly reformed is by applying also the IMF program that has been uh, suggested for Lebanon, and in order to also to have the IMF support that we need to uh, get out of this crisis. Yeah, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. Welcome back and thank you for being with us. Uh, we're talking to Michelle. Hello from, from, from Lebanon. We're talking about the condition in Lebanon. And, uh, you know, right now the condition in the south is really terrible. And uh, what's, uh, you know, you live in Lebanon. What's the update there? So the update is is bad. It's it's tough. Last night, three civilians were killed. Among them, I think a young uh, a young person, a young and and, and uh, a teenager was killed uh, by Israeli strikes. So the situation is is extremely difficult. We know it has been more than close to three hundred people that were killed, three hundred Lebanese in total that were killed. Uh, we're talking about more than six million square meters. Um, of, of rural lands, a lot of them agricultural lands that have been burnt completely by uh, bombing with, you know, phosphorus um, uh, uh, ammunition and missiles. So, so it's um, the situation is is extremely difficult. There's close to a hundred thousand people that have been forced to leave their houses from south of Lebanon to uh, uh, to other regions, and I think it's disastrous, really, and. We we're talking about several billions of dollars of damages done to the Lebanese economy. So in the end, it's not just the South that has been affected, but the whole country that has been affected. And it's also a massive immigration, general immigration that has hit us. And I come here to the biggest problem in my mind, which is the demographic issue. We're seeing a massive brain drain uh, of specifically of young people. And this is an absolute mm -hmm. disaster for us. So now the situation is what is that we're facing this absolute, um, uh, uh, you know, dramatic uh, fanaticism, fanaticism from the from the Israeli government that is waging a massive war uh, on 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 Gaza and on Lebanon, and this is this is absolutely dramatic, and we need to to face you know this uh, extremism, but we need to face it intelligently, and we need to face it with our state. What we are asking for is that the, the state, the Lebanese army and the diplomacy reclaim the initiative and reclaim their prerogative. They, they go and they uh, need to be deployed in the south because we need to not let um, South Lebanon become a platform for the war between Israel and Iran. And what uh, now the, what the Iranian access is trying to do, especially through Hezbollah, is very problematic because you know, they have been the one who have opened the southern front and in the end that have also opened hostilities with with uh, Israel. And, you know, Israel, the current government is an extreme right fanatic government. They have absolutely no limits, no boundaries in the way they fight. And they started bombing and destroying Lebanon. So the thing is, I think we need to be very careful and not believe that because we've been launching a couple of rockets on Israel, that means that we are winning, etc. No, the reality is that Israel is probably losing because they're they're you know they're headed for a disaster in the way they're they're being governed now. But we, 
as Lebanese, we have been losing all the way. We've been losing uh, a military. We've been losing so many lives. And I think every sure. single life of a Lebanese person, be it in the South or, or elsewhere, is, is essential. And we've been losing economically as well. So what we need now is very simple. It is a ceasefire, a complete ceasefire, unrelated to what's going on in Gaza. We need to support the Palestinians. So you think, you think, that, you think that Hezbollah fired on Israel because of Iran or they fired on Israel because of their solidarity with Gaza? Because of Iran. I think this is extremely clear. I don't so think Iran told people. them to fire on Israel? Absolutely. This is how right. Hezbollah... Traditionally, though, Iran does Hezbollah. not really get involved in the Hezbollah decision. I mean, that's, that's uh, independent... Yes, they get help from Iran, but they don't really, they don't, I mean, Iran does not impose any, 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 this, its decision on anybody in the area, Hamas or anybody in the area. I think this is, this is something very strategic. You know, what's, what's been going on is pretty huge. And we've, we've, we've listened from the very beginning, um, you know, this unity of France theory that has been theorized by Hassan Nasrallah for a while and by Hezbollah for a while. So, and, 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 and by the Iranians also for a while. So this is not something small, what has been going on. So when you talk about unity fronts, it really means that, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, uh, and the uh, Al-Quds forces, the, the IRGC and the Houthis in Yemen are all, you know, coordinating and fighting together. <coughs> so, so the problem here is, is basically first the decision, you know, who bears, who holds the decision of, should we fight or should we not fight? Is it the Lebanese government or is it not? And I think it's absolutely essential that the Lebanese government has the decision here. And in, in, on a good day, yes. On a good day, yes. But as you well know, absolutely. I mean, you live in Lebanon. Everybody in Lebanon takes order from somebody from the outside. So, you know, it's I think we need to stop that. Yeah, it's totally is no here. different. Don't you think you would lend more credibility for your movement if you approach it from a collective like it's time for us to be all Lebanese instead of taking orders from the outside, instead of singling one party. Absolutely. This is yeah. exactly our approach. This is exactly yeah. our approach. We yeah. have a lot of members that come from the south, uh, from all those villages that are being bombed now. Sure. And, and a lot of our members even have, you know, sometimes uh, in their family, they have Hezbollah yeah. members as well. Yeah. But, but, what, what, but our, our, our message is very clear, is yeah. we as Lebanese people, you know, we need... After all those years, those, those decades and those centuries of depending on foreign powers, be it in 1860 or in 1958 or during the French mandate or the Syrian occupation or the Israeli occupation, we need to only depend on ourselves in the sense that we need to at least be uh, sovereign in our decision making. Do yeah. we want war? If we want war, ahla sahla, but let it be the Lebanese government officially elected parliament that decides whether we want to go to war or not, but not... Oh. A, you know, another part. This this is absolutely essential that we stop being you know dependent on 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 foreign powers at least in our crucial decisions. Historically, Israel has had a territorial ambitions in Lebanon, specifically southern Lebanon. How do you defend that? So we need to be extremely, extremely firm and clear and strong in the face of Israel and the face of all any country that might want to invade or have any territorial ambition on Lebanon, be it Israel, be it Syria, like they've done for 30 years. How, how do you defend how do you groups. defend how do you defend southern Lebanon from Israel? We need to rearm the Lebanese army, to redeploy it, and, and we have enough members, we have enough trained members, and there are also several thousands of UNIFIL members that are in the south. And if you combine you know, Israel with, doesn't care, you know Israel doesn't care about all of that. I mean, the, the main issue is that Israelis traditionally, even before Israel became a state, they've had territorial ambitions. You know, the first guy to fight them was Patriarch Hawaiik. And then, and then, and then the, the Lebanese unity refused, even before the independence, as you well know, they refused to secede southern Lebanon. And then, and then they wanted to protect it, and they continue to do that. You know, but right now, and, you know, I mean, Lebanese and, armies wasn't even strong enough to 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 fight the small group in in the north not long ago. It's going to take a lot of work. Party, the National Bloc um, <clears throat> was part of the delegation that draw the that drew the the the, the borders of Lebanon, including yeah. you know all borders of Lebanon, um, yeah. and our political 
tradition and ideology, um, uh, especially with someone like Raymond Eddy, who've been extremely clear on our opposition to Israel and to the policies that Israel led, um, especially since the Nakba uh, and then 1967 war and all the wars um, that have been, that have been leading and, and the way they've been, you know, colonizing and um, and 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 how do you say and, and displacing the Palestinians. So this is a this is a cause that is extremely important for us. Sure, sure. Now, the Lebanese army during 1949 and uh, 1978 was able to defend the south, and there was no Israeli presence for those those those. Decades. 78 until 78 when they came into Lebanon. When yeah. they started invading Lebanon. And then actually in 78, they, they, they were occupying southern Lebanon, yeah. They occupied starting 78. Yeah. And they left in 2000. And since the day they, they left. The reason they left is because of the people fighting them, not because absolutely. of. Absolutely. And we yeah. defended also the right to resist. And I yeah. personally defended the right to resist. And when, and when they left in 2000, I went to the border and we were the first ones to, to support this. But since then, and especially since 2006, in the end of the war, there's been a international resolution which we asked for, we as Lebanon, 1701, that says we want a ceasefire on both sides, you know, to stop the hostilities, and we want to deploy the UNIFIL and the Lebanese army, and we ask for the Israelis to stop doing what they're doing. And from 2006 till October 8th last year, there's been nearly nothing, nearly not, not a single shot that was fired. <laughs> So this is what we need to keep and to protect. Absolutely. And I don't think that the Israelis today, even though they're fanatic, I don't think they want to occupy Lebanon. I think this is this is done. And um, what we need to do is fight at the same time. If they time, get a chance, the if they get a chance, they'll do it tomorrow. What we need to do is to support the Palestinian cause yeah. very strongly and to say this is the right. And without a Palestinian state, there will be no peace in the region. And, and we need this because we need equality and justice. And at the same time, we need to support Lebanon's territorial sovereignty and integrity through our state. And I think this Absolutely. is what will make us a, yeah. a, modern, a modern country, a modern state. Uh, uh, we're running out of time. Final thoughts? Uh, well, first, I want to thank you a lot for, for having me. I think that Absolutely. what matters is that, that we uh, not forget our country, where we come from, um, the importance of that country for us and for all the people that are that are interested in the Middle East, for all the people that that want to see this country as a as a beacon for freedom in the region, as a beacon for coexistence in the region. I think this is absolutely essential because coexistence and freedom will be um, and democracy will be at stake and at risk in the years to come, not only in our region, but everywhere across the world. And it is our role to show that actually there are models of coexistence that do work and proper solid democracies that are that, that can be built in the Middle East specifically. And um, so we do need everyone in this battle and we need specifically um, the Lebanese, the people of Michigan and all the Lebanese um, to, you know, be part of this constant struggle of let's not let our country down because it means a lot to so many people and to us. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So we need to fight for it. And I'm convinced that we have so much potential. When I see all the Lebanese uh, in Lebanon and abroad specifically, you know, the, the amount of human capital that is present among this diaspora, um, I know that one day we will succeed. So we need to fight this fight. And this is the fight of our generation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Khalil. As the weather gets colder, it's a good idea to layer up with scarves, hats, and mittens. Another layer of protection this season is to get your flu and COVID-19 vaccines. You can get both vaccines at the same time. Talk to your health care provider or learn more at michigan.gov slash COVID flu RSV and layer up for some added peace of mind. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. With more than 30,000 successful in vitro fertilizations, IVF Michigan is now ranked as one of America's best fertility clinics according to Newsweek magazine. IVF Michigan fertility centers are the recognized leaders in high quality fertility care. 
With locations in Bloomfield Hills and nine other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. A founding member, American Board Certified Dr. Nicholas Shama, is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. He has performed over 20,000 successful IVF cases and it's helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. When it's time to get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at one of America's best fertility clinics, call IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio toll free at 855-952-9600. 855-952-9600. Ziad Brand. Quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rigo Picon, Dana, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Alma Defour for being with us from France and Michel uh, hello from uh, Lebanon. The situation in Gaza continue to be fluid and it continue to be very sad. We hope that uh, uh, we reach a ceasefire soon and the whole situation changes. You have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Mike, for a great production. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You have a wonderful weekend. Bye now.